we are here with a very special guest, California State Senator Leland Yee. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for, for coming on. You are classing up the place a bit. This, this studio has, no. has not seen a suit and tie in, in quite a while, all many I'm, a day. All I'm doing is just graying the area, okay? That's all I am, okay? <laughs> you guys are so young. We need some sort of maturity, so that's why I'm, I'm here, I think. Uh, I think we got some maturity represented. We have uh, our community manager, Don Francis, here. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I've actually really been looking forward to this particular interview. Uh, Don is a, uh, a parent uh, of, of, of two, and... He is uh, he's here different different perspective maybe I, I I might be a little bit um, more embracing of all the the awful stuff that you might find in in the worst video games out there. Well, the two of you look like gamers. Oh, <laughs> don't don't uh, mistake a, uh... me for not being a gamer. I'm very much a player. <laughs> However, I I do tend to be more on the conservative side in terms of what I allow my children to see. Okay. So um, I'm hoping we have a, uh, a variety of perspectives here. Now, if, if you are unaware, uh, Lee Lindy authored Assembly Bill 1179 when he was in the State Assembly. It was a bill designed to prevent minors. It would, it would restrict the sale or rental of violent video games to minors, essentially. That's correct. And as soon as it was signed into law by Governor Schwarzenegger, the Entertainment Software Association, the Gaming Publishers Industry Trade Group, filed suit to keep it from going into effect. Uh, I think this was in 2005. That's correct. And uh, since then, there's been a legal battle over it, back and forth, and a judge uh, overturned the law, found it unconstitutional, and the state appealed that. The, the appeal was heard last Wednesday, and we could hear in the next few months a... Uh, a another decision on on that from the appellate court so basically uh leland a question i know you've you've been asked a lot of times uh why does this bill specify video games when minors can have access to so many other things like you know violent movies uh books music uh just other forms of media well as someone who uh, really understands and support and cherish our First Amendment. Uh, you know, I'm not one of those legislators that want to clamp down and uh, uh, censor all kinds of uh, different ways of expressing one's feelings, ideas. And so when we got involved in this particular area, uh, we were very, very careful to uh, not be too uh, overreaching uh, in any of our legislative efforts. And so what we what happened was that we then went in and surgically uh, uh, looked at a particular area of the uh, sort of gaming enterprise, and these are the first person, third person shooter, ultraviolet video games. The law does not uh, 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 talk about preventing the sale of violent video games whatsoever. It talks about a particular subclass of these. Uh, violent video games. These are the first person uh, uh, ultra violent video games where the push of a button uh, on a computer, on a keyboard, uh, then causes uh, the uh, individual in the screen to have their hips lopped off or someone uh, maiming and shooting someone or someone hacking an arm, a limb. Um, so it is that class of uh, uh, violent video game that we're going after. So not all M for Mature rated games necessarily would be covered by this. That's correct. It is only a small subset of these ultra-violent video games uh, or these uh, violent games, and these are what we call the ultra-violent uh, ultra video game. Okay. Now, w one thing that uh, I've, I've been curious about, because this bill is intended to aid parents in, in helping them monitor what their children play, uh, Parental confusion over rating systems has been an issue for quite a while. Uh, I know some people have, have advocated going to a universal radi rating system for music and movies and games, things of, of that nature. Uh, since the gaming rating system is already fairly uniform right now, as handled by the ESRB, uh, this, this law would require a 18 sticker be put on the games that, that fall under this law. That's... But does, does that not then kind of create like two separate rating systems 
for for these games that will be sold in California. The ESRB one, which is already kind of uh, standardized and and uh, people have a fairly high awareness of it, I think. And then also this other, whether or not it's it's legal to sell it to minors. Well, the problem with the ESRB rating is that it is a conflicted rating. There's conflict of interest riddled with that particular rating system. The very um, uh, ESRB that we have now is funded by the industry. So as you can imagine, uh, the ESRB is not going to be too hard on the industry because that's the uh, source of funding that they have. And that's one problem. The other problem is that the ESRB rating is a flawed rating because it does not capture the full extent of the content within a video game. It's not like a um, movie rating where you get a chance to view every second of the movie and then you slap a rating. Within these uh, ultraviolet video games, you are only sampling a portion and, and, and most times it is the portion that the uh, industry would then submit to the ESRB rating. So number one, it's conflicted. And then second, uh, it does really not represent the full flavor of a particular game. As for it being conflicted, is this not the same conflict that the MPAA has or the record labels when they decide to put parental advisory explicit lyrics on a on a disc or not? I would agree with you on that. Uh, you know, but but you know, trying to be respectful uh, towards uh, the First Amendment, you know, I'm not interested in going there uh, with uh, those other expressions, forms of expression. It is because of the fact that there is sufficient data that indicates that there's harmful effects to children uh, when you have these interactive games, when you play these interactive games. You overlearn the behavior, it becomes part of your repertoire. It is that particular problem that is created with these ultraviolet video games for children. Okay, well that, that data has um, been disputed by the industry obviously and uh, some some judges in other um, other venues have, have dismissed it out of hand almost. Uh, with when laws like this have come up in Louisiana, Illinois. I think uh, you're partially correct on that. Uh, um, uh, most of the other uh, laws that have been crafted uh, throughout the country uh, ha have been rather broad. And, and therefore, I, I think the evidence is not there yet to suggest that uh, some, of these ultra, uh, some of these violent games may in fact cause harm. But when we're looking at this particular subset, of ultraviolet video game, I think the data is there. I think the data suggests that. I think in addition to that, this is the same technology that uh, the armed forces and our uh, police and fire utilize uh, to train uh, their workers, uh, their their um, uh, public safety employees, uh, the soldiers and so on. They teach you how to stalk and how to hunt down and shoot and kill your enemy. Well, that's just like books. You know, a manual can teach you how to stalk and hunt and kill your enemy just the same as, you know, a, a, a primer for children can teach them how to read. The only difference, uh, and, 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 and I, I, you know, I would agree with you I, I, to some extent. The only difference is that in the ultraviolet video game, there is a coordination between your hand movement and the action that occurs. So this is not passive. This is active, this is interactive, whereby your movement uh, basically then ties a particular action. It is that learning that goes on uh, that is uh, particularly problematic uh, uh, for many of us uh, in this field as psychologists, as educators. Too. Okay. Uh, let's, let's move on to the, uh, to the language of the law. Um, the law requires that a reasonable person would find the game as a whole appeals to a deviant or morbid interest of minors. And I think part of that is that uh, societally edifying works would, would still, like um, Schindler's List was shown on network TV, even though it had violence and full frontal male nudity and things like that, where the, the quality of the work as a whole, that this is an exception to be made for games that would meet that. Uh, but how, how is a minor's deviant or morbid interest any different from an adult's? And would something like homosexuality be considered a deviant interest? No, the way in which um, you know we we pattern uh, the law that we have 
uh, to uh, basically pornography, allowing uh, you know local standards to make those kinds of determination. You know, we don't want to be the sort of thought police, but rather what we want to do is to allow a uh, community uh, in general to make those kinds of determination as you know what is really appropriate. And I'm not talking about individual towns and individual cities, but rather the state of California. So is it the publisher's responsibility to make sure that those 18 stickers are on all of their their games? The way in which the uh, bill is fashioned is that uh, the state of California, you know, if in fact uh, this law uh, is allowed to then be implemented, that the state of California will then be working with the industry in terms of making the determination as to, you know, what those uh, uh, um, ultraviolet video games uh, would in fact be, what qualifies uh, those games to be these ultraviolet, and then they will then have to have this 18 sticker uh, on their uh, on on their uh, games. Well, the community standards in California, even though this is a, a fairly blue state, uh, vary wildly from community to community. What what passes in San Francisco or Berkeley uh, may not pass in in other parts of the state. Is is this not a, a, a big issue when you have community standards determining and you know no one authority handing out these eighteen stickers? saying this game, that game, that game deserves them. Well, you know, you're always going to run into those difficulties where you're going to get variations uh, from one city to the other, one locality to the other. But I think ultimately uh, the state of California coming together will, in fact, uh, be able to uh, uh, have some agreement. Just as in our pornography law now, uh, we have a general sense as to what those local standards may be. And everyone complies to that as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for children. Okay. Uh, one more question about the language of the law. Uh, you've got definitions in there for what constitutes a violent video game and specific words like cruel, depraved, heinous, and, uh, serious physical abuse, and torture. Now, this country has just seen in recent years how insane the confusion and the argument can get over what constitutes torture. And that's, that's in real life when things are being done to real people. When it happens to a video game character, especially uh, under the law has to have substantially human characteristics, it seems to me like there are so many definitions in there for people to argue about and, and, and so much leeway for people to fudge, you know, well, is this substantially human? Does that, is a bear substantially human? Does that mean hunting games are off limits? How can you, can you hope to to have a, a, a law that, that really makes it clear for everyone involved who, what can and can't be sold and, and, you know, even the creators before a game is on shelves, whether or not what they're making will fall under that law. Well, when, you know, one, one of the things that we did, in fact, spend a lot of time relative to this bill was to identify who, in fact, would be the target. You know, what, what, what exactly... Uh, would a game need to include to fall into this particular area? And we particularly uh, exempted, uh, you know, creatures, uh, those individuals that are fan of, uh, uh, of uh, fanciful kinds of thought or ideas and really looking at human individuals or human-looking uh, individuals. So I think that reasonable people can, in fact, agree, you know, what is going to be human-like. Uh, um, uh, characters. I think that the other uh, quality of this uh, particular set of criteria, um, uh, the, the torture, the heinous uh, activities and so on, I, I, I think all of us will be able to agree, you know, what, what those kinds of behaviors might be. I think that the reference that you're making uh, uh, in terms of the Iraq war and how we dealt with the prisoners and so on, I think that there were, as you probably know, a lot of political overlay to this. This is really about just trying to define, uh, you know, what that may be and then to suggest that these then um, uh, games that include these kinds of activity would not be sold to kids. The political overlay is uh, a byproduct of, of a group of people wanting it to be one way and a group of people wanting it to be the other way. And 
regardless of whether or not it's politics, you're still going to have that with these games. You will have publishers that want a more permissive definition of all these words, and then you'll have parental groups and, and people such as yourself maybe that would want a bit more restrictive definition. Well, well the, the, you know, the way we've handled that is that it is not just, you know, the, the torture itself, but it is rather, you know, the, the, the definition or the context of that particular torture. You know, um, the, the, does it uh, reflect, you know, just kind of frivolous type of uh, uh, inappropriate behavior, negative behavior? Uh, is it, in fact, uh, uh, categorized as something that one would say Ooh, it was heinous? And so those are the kinds of qualities that we would add uh, to some of the, those definitions. Okay. Is, is there a reason that this bill only covers violence with the, with the exception of that uh, sexual abuse uh, clause? There's, there's no real mention of, of sexual anything in this bill. Well, again, um, you know, for me as a psychologist, as a father, uh, what I was looking at was really trying to protect our children and, and, and that there was, in fact, substantial scientific data that suggests that these kinds of games had a harmful f effect to children. I think the other was that, uh, you know, despite, I think, uh, other people characterizing our work, this was really not about trying to prevent or limit uh, anyone's First Amendment. As, as I've said many times before, within this particular bill, if it were to be implemented, it would not prevent one artist, uh, one uh, game developer from doing even more horrible things to human-like uh, characters. They could, they could make you maybe eat a bomb and blow you to 10,000 pieces. Uh, this bill would not prevent you from doing that. All this bill says is that just don't sell it to kids. Do you not worry about a chilling effect, basically, from, from creators that don't want to have to worry about the headache of whether or not their game would fall under un, under the, the, the guise of this bill and, and toning things down uh, specifically to avoid it? Well, I, you know, I think that if you go there, huh, then I think we are opening the door as to really why the gaming industry is not interested in limiting the sale of these ultraviolet video games to kids. We have always believed that the reason why the gaming industry wants to uh, be able to sell to kids is because that's where the market is. That's where the money is made. We have on a number of occasions uh, looked at, well, why aren't these games uh, labeled as AO, you know, adult only? And my understanding is that if you were to label a game AO, you know, the market share would just simply drop tremendously. So we have always felt that the opposition uh, to our bill from the industry was not about kids. It was more about money. And that's really unfortunate. Okay. Um, well, we've been uh, joined here by our editor-in-chief, Ricardo Torres. Hello. Okay. And um, I, I, kn I know you guys probably have a couple questions you would like to, to pose to Mr. Yi as well. Mm -hmm. Don, Ricardo? Yeah, I, I was wondering, you keep referring to the research that's been done in this publicly available data, I'm assuming. Uh, who was surveyed in this? I mean, are you only asking parents? Are you only surveying minors? Are you only surveying... Uh, the core gamer demographic, which tends to be single males between 18 and 30 years old. Well, what um, uh, what you know what this bill uh, says is that these ultraviolet video games have harmful effects to children, and that the state has an interest in terms of protecting kids. And so, when you make that particular argument, you then have to then identify the body of scientific literature that's that 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 would suggest that so the literature that we're referring to are really not just uh, 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 surveys of, of, of individuals but really you know looking at um, uh, uh, youngsters who play these games and then asking them uh, you know what kinds of reactions do they have um, how do would they solve different kinds of, um, uh, of uh, potentially aggressive uh, 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 issues and how would they handle these kinds of problems. And, and what we invariably find is that there is a high correlation 
of individuals who play these games and also um, uh, having ideations or having actual behavior of, of um, these uh, ultraviolence. And that's what we're um, uh, uh, pinning our data on. Now, the critics, and, and I'll accept the point, that that does not lay out a cause and effect relationship. Uh, what we're saying, however, is that there's a preponderance of correlational data that would then suggest that uh, there's a high propensity of playing these games and ultra-violent video, uh, and ultra-violent uh, 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 behavior. So it's so much that they're linked, not necessarily that one causes the other? That's correct. Right. That's correct. So then what about the parents? Uh, not necessarily like me, because I keep my children to a, a tighter standard. But what about the parents who want to go and get games that are ultra-violent for their kids? Well, we all, all also looked at that and took that into consideration. Uh, again, many critics of our law has been that, well, why don't we let the parents decide? You know, why is it that the state will get in uh, to this uh, kind of business? And uh, our, our comment was that, again, um, what we were trying to do was really not to limit parents. Uh, this law, if enacted, would in fact help parents to monitor their kids. All the law says is that you cannot, as a store owner, mm -hmm. retailer, sell this particular game to a kid. However, if the parents want to buy it for, the, uh, uh, for their kids, if the uh, aunt and uncle wants to buy it or your adult friend wants to buy it, they are within their right. The law does not prevent that from happening. So to some extent, um, you know, this bill helps a parent and kid's relationship because if the kid cannot purchase it mm -hmm. and the only way in which you can get it is go to mom or dad, then hopefully that will be the case. It will cause some discussion. And then if the parent really wants to get it for the kid, regardless, you can still do that. I guess what I'm most curious about is that is similar to what happens right now. I mean, we do have games that are technically not supposed to be sold to, to younger individuals. That cor that's correct. Uh, and that doesn't seem, and I, it seems to be very similar to, you know, to sort of what you're proposing with the law. And I think that you're still going to have the same, there's this, there's always the same workaround because there will be the adult friend. There will be the, maybe the uncle that nobody likes, but is always a bad influence on the kid, you know, that, that will pick that up. It's, I don't know, to me, the, the issue of this has always been on the parents because I feel Fundamentally, um, a, a lot of parents sort of in, in our age group now that sort of grew up playing video games are using them as a babysitting tool, and they're not paying attention to what their kids are playing. I mean, I have an 11-year-old nephew, and I had many a discussion with my sister before I was able to bring anything into the house for him, and, you know, and, and her and, and her little kind of, you know, parenting circle set, whatever, they take it very seriously, and I think in a lot of ways the the law almost seems as though it's, it's a bit of a crutch for sloppy parents. Well, I, 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 I would absolutely agree with you. I, I think that the reality is that we uh, uh, utilize uh, uh, these video games um, as sort of a crutch uh, for babysitting or good uh, child rearing. Um, and it is because of that uh, that we have that provision uh, in our particular bill that uh, parents, if you want to buy it, you still can get it. But, you know, you as a youngster cannot get it yourself. And how that sort of, you know, handles, I think, some of the concerns that you have is that the reality is that uh, not a lot of uh, kids uh, may, in fact, go to their parents to talk about, well, this is what I wanted and so on, and I'll go get it anyway. And by limiting uh, the ability of retailers to sell it to kids, then hopefully that's going to force kids to then go to their parents and work that out. I think secondly, um, we, what, what we're trying to do, again, is to you know, find a good balance between respecting the First Amendment and also um, the state uh, taking some responsibility over the healthy development of our kids. Um, you know, we, 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 we were not interested in saying to parents and to adults, you can't do certain things and so on. And I think we wanted to be respectful of that First Amendment. So 
if the parents, if the aunt and uncle feels that this is okay uh, with us and we don't think it's harmful and, and, and whatnot, um, then you know we were not going to stand in the way of these adults saying that you can then have these games for their children or for their nieces and uh, a nephew. Okay. Now, I think uh, whenever these laws come up, uh, gamers are pretty galvanized about, you know, mm. they, they are against them, regardless of whether they are well-intentioned or well-designed or whether they limit what should be limited or, or, or not. But I'd like, I'd like to just kind of hammer home a few points to them here. There are some questions uh, to get at that. Is video game legislation a Democratic cause or is it a Republican cause? I don't know if it's a Democratic cause or it's a Republican cause. Uh, but, but one thing that I will share with you is that uh, it is amazing of, as, as to the number of states that have tried to enact similar laws, albeit that every one of them have failed. I think ours have the best chance of surviving because we've been very, very careful of not uh, writing roughshod over the First Amendment. It's narrowly tailored. I think what is also instructive is that, albeit, as you indicated, Brian, that the um, lower court did, in fact, uh, slap a permanent injunction on our law, that the lower court did say that the state had standing on this particular matter. And what that means in terms of plain language is that the state does have a responsibility and can exercise that responsibility in protecting kids from these ultraviolet video games. I think the question now is going to be more, how do we do that? And I think that is the debate. That's the discussion at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. And so either way of however the Ninth Circuit's going to um, uh, uh, rule on this particular matter, I think either side's going to appeal this. It's going to go to the Supreme Court. And I think that hopefully what we're going to end up uh, in, in California and then I think throughout the nation is a balance of how do you protect the First Amendment? How do you ensure that there is not going to be limitation on the free expression of individuals' desires and wants and creativity on the, uh, um, you know, developing these games, but then yet on the, at the same time protecting our kids and the general public? Okay. Now, I'm sure you've heard the, the outcry from the gamer community um, whenever, whenever we talk about this. Have you heard that outcry from your constituents? Um, I, I, I have not um, heard a loud outcry from my constituent. I think that there are many individuals uh, from the gaming uh, community who have uh, expressed some concern over this particular bill. But the, the, the concern is more not about the bill itself, but about the super slope. You know, many of the gamers themselves would argue that some of these things that we are developing are not appropriate for children. But I think that the fear that they have is that if this is the beginning, uh, is this also the end? Uh, are there going to be other bills coming? And I think that that's where the concern comes in. So if if gamers uh, don't like that their local politicians are are proposing things like this, would it really make that much of a difference if they spoke up, if they, if they wrote their politicians and let them know, yes, I am a voter, I am a gamer, I don't like what you're doing? There, there is an organized effort uh, to let me know very clearly that, uh, that a lot of the gamers are not interested in what I'm doing or not supportive of what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm not trying to be arrogant and disrespectful towards them. But I am a legislator myself, and I need to look at what is also right. Leadership sometimes is not about just simply putting your finger in the political wind and seeing how everybody feels, but rather having some hard core values as what you think is appropriate and what you think is right and trying to do the right thing. I mean, in this uh, coming uh, election today, uh, we're asking the entire nation to look at candidates and asking, are they willing to do the right thing regardless of whether or not we like it or not? And that's what I'm trying to do. So then if I can ask, uh, in every process for creating policy, there are opportunity costs because you have a finite amount of time 
with a certain group of individuals such as yourselves who are the lawmakers. So then you understand that within that time frame, you're only going to get X number of policies in place or passed, if you will. So then what was the opportunity cost that could have been done within the state that this particular bill took the place of? Two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 well, but but you know that's you know we, we we all have to kind of go through that. I mean, the Civil Rights Act uh, was appealed, and uh, you know it was litigated. Um, a lot of discriminatory public policy, social policy, we had to litigate, and, and so on. so I don't know if that's the correct uh, uh, concern about the money. Um, one one of the things that I do uh, is that I try to look at. What's important to children? What's important in terms of our healthcare system? And so, we our legislative agenda and our legislative package is really directed in those areas. And uh, if we had not uh, done this bill, uh, there would have been another bill. Uh, I mean, we've got another idea where right now in the state of California, uh, you know, youngsters who commit a capital crime are sent to prison for the rest of their life. They are never, ever going to see daylight. They will never, ever be paroled. Uh, that is going to be a hard uh, a battle, and we're going to take on that particular battle. Uh, we don't think that you should send children uh, to prison for the rest of their life. Uh, I think that they uh, can be rehabilitated. Their lives can be turned around, and that's going to cost quite a bit of our time. Uh, but so we, 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 we kind of look at an issue, and uh, this happened to be one of those issues that are important to children, and that's how we ended up uh, taking them on. I guess um, to sort of pick up the thread there, I mean, it seems like one of the fundamental um, things at the heart of this is education. It's, you know, you're talking about behaviors that are inappropriate that, that people are, are you know, the children are taking to heart and actually acting on. And it seems to me like the effort, don't you think it would be better spent to maybe focus on our schools because the California school system is have has some issues? And... You know, I I just still believe that no, there isn't a product out there that can undermine good parenting. I mean, my nephew has very specific guidelines about what he can play at home. And besides that, my sister is very good at explaining. My sister and my brother-in-law both are fantastic parents and they're good at explaining why this is not cool. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what he's exposed to when he goes to other people's houses. He understands that this is not right. And I almost feel like maybe let's – focus the money and the effort into just getting a really strong educational system in place and, you know, making better parents. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with you as a educator myself. I, I think it's extremely important that uh, we develop these skills uh, within our children so that they can make right decisions, that the state does not have to come in and then kind of tell them uh, what they should or should not do. Uh, the, but the difficulty is that the educational uh, system that we have, not only in the state of California, but throughout the country, are s sort of maxed out themselves. I mean, they've got tremendous pressures about looking at uh, higher achievement, uh, uh, world-class standards, uh, additional requirements that, that, that just really strain the uh, uh, school day already. And, and I would hope that they can do it, but the reality is that they're not able to do that and we do have youngsters um, who are in these kinds of really difficult situations where, unfortunately, they play these games. And they play it not only hundreds but thousands of hours. And literally, you know, we've had anecdotal data that talks about how these kids are playing the games uh, during the day and acting out the behavior at night. Okay. Well, uh, I know you've got other, other places to be. Uh, thank you for taking the time. It's out always of, a, a, a pleasure to be here and it's always to match with with all of you, even <laughs> though you have three against me. <laughs> I don't know that was necessarily against you. <laughs> See, next time bring friends. <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, as I said over the years, uh, I think we're all interested in the same thing of how do you protect the First Amendment and then at the same time uh, protect our children. And, and it is a fine balance. And I do appreciate all of the questions and concerns because as a individual who came to this country and loving the values that we have, the democratic principles, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the freedom that we have, uh, I'm all there to support that and protect that. But at the same time, we've got to protect our kids. Great. Well, thank you very much.